Berserk is a grim, dark fantasy manga made by Kentaro Miura. However, many people right alongside JoJo's fans just call it the Bible. Unfortunately, I had only found out about the series a year or two back after the passing of its creator, which led me to checking out the series. I only planned on having a little gander at a few pages, and needless to say, I was... Shocked? I think is the best word I can come up with at the moment. Now that I'm entirely caught up with the manga, I can officially say that Berserk is one of my favorite mangas I have ever read. I truly mean that. It's immediately up there with my own personal big three. So of course, months later, I find myself where I am now. Writing this video, brooding at the night sky underneath a tall oak tree, and craving as much Berserk content as I can get. So much so that I finished the anime from the 90s, and the 2016 adaptation, plus that three-part movie. Once I finished all there was to experience on that front, I of course had to move on to the video games. The first game I found was Berserk the Band of the Hawk for PS4 and PS Vita. So I bought it, played it on my PS5, then bought it again on my PS Vita, just so I could play it again, but laying down. Don't ask how much it cost me. I said don't ask! The next couple of games that I stumbled upon really surprised me because I found out that only three official Berserk games have been made, which is odd to me knowing how well this series is enjoyed. Also the fact that it's just pure peak. I assume that with there being a lot of touchy subjects in the manga, advertisers and companies simply just won't even go near it. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot. Oh! However, the one game that intrigued me the most was a little game on the Sega Dreamcast called Sword of the Berserk Guts' Rage. Now, the thing about this game that stood out to me so much was the fact that this game is dubbed. Duh! Sword of the Berserk released in Japan as Berserk Millennium Falcon Arc Chapter of the Flowers of Oblivion. Doesn't quite roll off the tongue, but it's still a badass title nonetheless. It later released on March 15th, 2000 here in the US. Sword of the Berserk looks to have been the world's first gander into what a Berserk game would be like. And to pretty positive reviews, it looks like everyone liked what they saw. And from everything I've read and seen so far doing research to write this, I think I'm gonna enjoy it too. So let's get a more hands-on and personal experience with the title. So without further ado, let's roll. <coughs> we open up with an epic narration about a warrior in a land plagued by darkness who wields a big old sword. His enemies will know true fear once he starts to swing. I, I wonder who that could be. We then pan to an older gentleman and a young woman whose wagon appears to have broken down. Wait, she has a puppy? Okay, yeah, they're all dead. And if we all check here in our official Berserk handbook, I can only assume in the most grotesque way possible. Oh my god, bandits! It'll cost you, though. Wait, is that Mark Hamill? Hey, now. You're a little cutie, ain't you? Gross. Out of left field wanders in Casca as she approaches and pets the puppy. The bandits plan on taking and selling her amongst other things, which only means they're all about to meet a painful end. There we go. Ah, ah, what the With Guts' arrival, it introduces us to the combat, which honestly ain't bad. However, we aren't given any tutorial on how to play, so you better hope to God that your copy has a manual or else you're in for some trial and error. But that's what Berserk is about. The struggle. You can use Guts' crossbow arm, throw knives, beat the shit out of people with your fists, and of course, use the Dragon Slayer to cut down all those dumb enough to go up against someone who's able to wield a 300 pound sword like it's a bubble wand. But mostly use it on apostles. I won't delve too much into the combat or controls because this isn't necessarily an analytical breakdown or deep dive into the game. More of a goofy first hands-on experience from a ball. How am I holding the controller? After tearing apart those who threaten Casca, we're thanked by the duo we saved in the process. You saved our lives! Oh look, it's Puck! <laughs> One of the travelers we saved introduces themselves as Rita, a traveling performer, and Puck introduces us as... Gatsu? This mean looking guy is Gatsu. Weird. I mean, the cover of the game says Guts, so I wonder why they changed his name to Gatsu. It's not a big deal regardless. Yeah. Rita invites us to watch her performance in the next town, seeing as we have to cut through there anyway. I mean, why not? What can go wrong with a couple of people forever marked as a sacrifice to the darkness of the world? A lot. Arriving in the town, oh, backflip dog. Arriving in town after listening to this game's banger soundtrack, we find Rita mid-performance announcing the main event. A strong man wielding a big ass weapon, who isn't Guts, stumbles over only to be revealed he's supposedly possessed by something called the Mandragora. He's possessed by the Mandragora! Leaving Guts to save everyone from him as he goes crazy in the street. Upon defeating him, Rita's upset we killed her friend as the town shuns her. The game drops hints at the beginning here that something is at play, as Rita's friend didn't attack anyone until provoked by them throwing stones at him. 
A wagon arrives, introducing us to White Ganondorf. Everyone stand back. Baron Balzac is here for an inspection. <laughs> my, my, my apologies, I mean Balzac. <laughs> Baron Balzac thanks Guts and explains that people turn into these monsters after being exposed to a disease that originated in a nearby village. The Baron says that Casca's current state resembles those who are afflicted by the disease, and he thinks his doctors may be able to help her. They're invited to the Baron's castle, and Guts reluctantly agrees and follows as the leftover guards close in surrounding Rita. <sighs> Making their way through the Baron's castle, Balzac tells Guts he'd like to show him something. All right, we'll go, but if you try to kill us, I'll scream! Guts leaves Casca and Puck's small but capable hands in what ends up to be an immediately terrible decision as she wanders off, stumbling upon a painting of a woman. She's beautiful. Who could she be? Where? Were you asking me? Returning to Guts being led through the castle, the brain of sacrifice begins aching, as we are told that the area we're in is being used to house Mandragoran as doctors search for a cure for the disease, kept secret from the people to prevent panic. Balzac begins explaining a tale of how those possessed by the Mandragoran plants are filled with youth and vigor, and any previous ailments or diseases are cured upon being taken over. However, they're also injected with a poison that drives them mad in the process. Guts learns that the only way to acquire a cure to the Mandragoran disease without risking possession is to cut out the heart of a fully grown Mandragoran tree and craft a cure with it, as the heart of a Mandragoran tree continues to regenerate without death even after it's been removed from the body. Balzac offers Guts the task of going and extracting said heart from a full grown great tree, and in return, they will use the cure to heal Casca's mind. Guts states that he knows Balzac is hiding something from him, but accepts anyways in hopes that this cure will help Casca. Speaking of, Casca and Puck are wandering the halls of the castle as two guards are seen carrying in Rita. She calls to Casca for help as the two guards are taken down with the barrage of arrows from behind. Stop looking at me. The Baron's first task is that he requests Guts to speak to a nun who calls herself the protector of the Mandragoran. However, their conversation is cut short by a guard who alerts Balzac that their enemies have infiltrated the castle. The Baron leaves and Guts is alerted to a commotion outside involving crowds of people being released from their cells, including a few Mandragoran who have turned full on aggro. So Guts daredevil hallway scenes his way through the crowd, continuing his way through the castle looking for Casca as Puck arrives with terrible no. Puck tells us that during the commotion, a group of strange men took Casca away with them, and they were heading towards the back gate. Damn it, Puck! I thought we left her in your capable yet small hands! Making their way to where the men who took Casca were last spotted, we run into Rita's dog, who Puck says knows where Casca is. No, I, I'm not making the obvious lassie joke. Searching the town, we stumble upon a door being guarded by three men. Guts demands to know where they took Casca, all as Puck talks shit to them from the safety of... Guts. The men say that we've seen too much, and we have to die seen what? You guys standing in front of a door? Right before we go to fight, a man rounds the corner who some of you might recognize as Paul Eiding, the voice of Colonel Campbell in the Metal Gear Solid series. I was just told about you a moment ago. Rita emerges from behind him and starts roasting Guts for not being able to protect Casca. You think you're so tough with that big hunk of metal hanging on your back? You don't even know me! The man reveals himself as Duntev and tells us that Casca is safe with them. He takes us inside revealing that he's a part of a resistance that hides within the ruins beneath the town. Duntev states that Balzac deceived Guts, and in his research into the Mandragoran, he's become a cruel tyrant, only conducting his human experiments and holding the Mandragoran prisoner in order to research a way to weaponize them. Arriving where they're keeping Casca, Duntev asks Guts where he'll go now. Guts tells him that even with the information of what kind of man Balzac is and what he's done to his people, Guts still plans on helping him if it means he can fix Casca. Duntev is upset by Guts' decision, stating he has no proof Balzac is even attempting to make a cure. We're shown that his child is sick, and his significant other insists if there is a cure, they could use this research to save their child infected by the Mandragoran, but Dunteth refuses any help from someone who's oppressed their people for so long. The Exposition Express continues, as Rita attempts to sway him into accepting help for the sake of his own child, saying he's being tied down by the fate of his ancestors. Are you going to trade this child's future for the past? Still refusing, he says that someday Rita will understand shedding blood for a cause, and hopefully whatever cause she gets behind, that blood will be worth it. Rita, you're still young. There will come a time when you'll shed blood for your own cause. I just hope that it's something worthy of that blood. Rita storms off upset by the conversation, with Puck and Guts following to console her. Well, yeah, mostly Puck. Guts is just there. Rita. In a moment with Guts letting out his inner southern drool. Found by spilled blood, huh? He states that she's right about being bound by spilled blood. 
However, at some point, following what Dunteth told her, she'll need to find a cause worth getting behind. Man, these cutscenes are long! A few minutes later, Dunteth announces he'll help them retrieve the heart of the Great Tree, and afterwards will negotiate a deal with Balzac for the cure. I have made my decision. I am going with you to the Great Tree to get its heart. Right after Guts and Dunteth set out to retrieve the heart, the Baron's cronies arrive where the Resistance has been hiding, taking Rita and Casca prisoner. Well, I'll be. It's the young lady from before. Saying they perfected their research and no longer need the tree's heart. Oh, come on. We just had to come and see your performance, didn't we, Rita? No amount of flips your dog can do are worth this much trouble. Unless he could do, like, five flips. Can he? Cutting the guts and his team headed for the great tree, they're attacked by a Mandragorn monster! In the scuffle, Guts is separated from the group, and we make our way through the forest alone, battling the monsters that lay in wait as we head to the great tree. Arriving at the village, Guts' brand of sacrifice begins to ache once more, as one of the members of their group pulls one of the plants out of the ground, causing it to shriek. The shriek kills every member of the group, leaving only Guts alive, as Dunteth gives his final words to Guts for his wife and child. Tell my wife and son, uh leaving an enraged Guts by himself to deal with the zombie village. Guts fights the seemingly endless waves upon waves of the Mandragoran zombies, as a nun emerges, commanding us to sheathe our weapon and return the uprooted Mandragoran to the Earth. Guts putting the pieces together recognizes her as the guardian of the Mandragoran, and she introduces herself as Ariza. I am Ariza. Ariza tells Guts that Mandragoran aren't aggressive, and so long as they aren't attacked or instigated, they won't harm anybody. I feel like this rule kind of goes for anything and everybody, so I mean, yeah, sound advice. Before we can get any more information, an injured Rita emerges from the woods, calling out for Guts. Asking what's wrong, Rita tells Guts that Balzac's men attacked the hideout, capturing Casca, and if he wanted her back safely, he needs to return with the heart of the tree. But didn't the old guy that attacked the hideout say they don't need it anymore? I don't know. Guts pleads with her for the information he needs to find the tree as she tells a story for the love of Christ, sister! Time is of the essence! She tells the story of a boy named Nico, a young gentle soul who was often teased by the village. <laughs> Excuse me. However, one winter, Nico was on the brink of death, starving due to the failing crops. With the last of his strength, he crawled to the church she was in, but unfortunately, he wasn't noticed in time and passed away. After the story that kind of seemed to go nowhere, only just to reveal that the young boy carried a bayonet, Ariza pleads with Guts to leave the village be, followed by Rita exclaiming that if they do nothing, then the Mandragoran will continue to infect everyone, as Sister Ariza says that everyone is better off that way. Guts having enough says he's taking the heart with or without her permission, and to stay out of his way if she knows what's best. Sorry if that shocks you and ruins your plans, but I'm taking the heart of the great tree with me. Daddy, chill. We fade back to an imprisoned Casca as Puck sneaks in through the window, trying to find a way for her to escape. Puck to the rescue! However, not long after Puck arrives, monsters begin emerging around them in the cell, right as, is that motherfucking nose for our two Zod? Taking note of Casca, he knows that Guts is somewhere nearby. You're that branded swordsman's woman. <laughs> then he must be nearby. Zod making his way to find Guts leaves just as fast as he arrived. Taking the opportunity to escape, Puck and Casca make their way out. The castle guards aren't far behind, so Casca and Puck find themselves going through a series of rooms and secret doors, eventually ending up in Balzac's daughter's room. And then from there, finding a secret room within the daughter's room containing a Frankenstein baby. <laughs> Not long after, Balzac finds them hiding within the room. And as it so turns out, this California raisin's baby is a Mandragoran tree heart. Balzac approaching to take it back, the heart lets out a cry, alerting all the neighboring Mandragoran within the castle all the way to the village that Guts is currently in. Inside Sister Arise's church, Guts finds a secret passageway, having Rita stay behind, big brain move, as he follows the passageway to see where it leads. Fighting our way through an as above, so below series of tunnels, we find Sister Ariza next to a huge Mandragorn, and within it is none other than Nico from her story that she told us earlier. Sister Ariza turns out to be a Mandragorn, and Nico is revealed to be the Mandragorn Heart. Guts begins fighting the huge Nico Ariza Mandragorn in a scenario similar to the Poison Ivy boss fight from Batman Arkham Asylum. Defeating Nico, Ariza grabs him and runs off as we give her chase back above the church as we see the village is in flames as Balzac's new Mandragoran soldiers have ravaged the village. Unable to deal with the violence anymore, Ariza runs back into the burning church with Nico in her arms after praying for God to bring peace to the sinners. 
Rita collapses to the ground in terror from what she's witnessed and spots a necklace out of the corner for it's the bail. Oh my god, bro. Back on her feet, she tells Guts the men here are the ones who took Casca. And enraged Guts asks Balzac's men why, as they state they followed Guts, keeping an eye on him, which led all the henchmen to the resistance base back in town. With Guts knowing what they've done and what they have planned, of course, they can't allow him to live. As the men surround Guts, Zod drops down on top of one of the VV Final Fantasy looking fucks, squashing him like a ball of putty. Balzac's men run away, petrified as Zod turns around to address Guts. That's right, guys. As I said earlier, no rest stops on the Expedition Express. Both Guts and Zod agree to attempt settling their business right then and there, as a boss fight ensues between the two of them. After a badass yet incredibly difficult fight with Zod, both men, I mean, man and monster, agree to end their fight there for now because, well, they both have other things to do. Yeah, literally, they're both just like, oh man, I'd stay, but I'm so busy. Zod tells us that Casca's in trouble and then flies off. Rita notices that with the Great Tree being destroyed, all the saplings are dying, freeing the people of their control. The townsfolk, now back to normal, see the carnage and death around them, and blame Guts for the destruction, as him and Rita rush back to the castle. They were so happy... before... before we came. Crossing the bridge right about to enter the town, Guts and Rita meet up with Puck, as he explains to them, And the Mandragorans in the castle are going crazy, and Balsack's sending out the troops, and he's sending Mandragoran troops from the lab, too! And townspeople are being possessed by flowers, and rampaging is also confusing! That! Puck begins leading us to Casca as we now have to fight our way through the town and castle, taking on waves of Mandragorn and castle guards. Also, we can now go finally smack Balzac with a big flat end of the sword. Inside the castle, Gut spots the woman that Puck and Casca saw in the room they were hiding in earlier. Puck says he recognizes her, believing her to be Balzac's daughter. Rita insists on taking her with them for safety as the gang ventures further into the castle. We now fight through the cramped corridors of the labs and holding cells within the castle. Taking on swarms of Mandragoran, I'm not sure if it was intentional by design or not. However, these cramped halls and rooms encourage you to use your fists and other weapons, seeing as the Dragon Slayer will get caught mid-swing on objects within them. So good level design, accidental or not, all I know for sure is that it was a pain in the ass! Arriving in the new room, Guts is met by Balzac's guards as the door shuts behind us, leaving Guts to use his sword as an impromptu shield to defend himself from a round of archers. Discount Quaker Oats here orders the guards to take us down as he retreats to the shadows like a little fucking troll he is. We battle further through the castle, clearing a grand hall and defeating the European KFC colonel. I'm joking! Stop! 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 Bursting into the room, Guts demands to know where Casca's being kept while- Stop looking at me like that. While Balzac refuses to answer, seeing as Guts didn't fulfill his end of their agreement. You know, I'm looking through the documents here, and kidnapping Casca was NOT a part of the agreement either! Rita steps forward, asking how he fell so low, when the townspeople he's oppressed for so long used to call him an enlightened man. Balzac goes on to talk of how heavy the burden was caring for a sick wife who never got better, the townspeople living in poverty, and the never-ending battles with opposing forces. It all piled up, becoming too much to bear, with everyone looking to him for saving and answers. He found relief through spilling blood on the battlefield, becoming enthralled with the sight of it. But even now, that doesn't bring him joy. Okay, man, that's great and all, but where is this going? Balzac reveals that the woman we thought was his daughter is actually his wife, who, much like Casca, doesn't remember who or what anybody or anything is. He's been regularly giving her the extract from the Mandragoran heart to cure her illness, and while it indeed cured her illness, it wiped her memory entirely. In a bout of rage and sadness, Balzac ingests the Mandragoran essence he's extracted and becomes a Mandragoran monster himself, leading us to our final showdown with him. Upon defeating him, Guts and Rita look on the fallen Baron and his wife, almost in a sort of pity of the tragedy of how both of their lives had turned out. But before they can finish their thoughts, Puck enters the room, having finally found where they've been keeping Casca. Rita! Heading through a tunnel somewhere within the castle, massive Mandragoran roots begin bursting through the walls behind them as they rush through in an attempt to not get crushed by the newly emerging roots. Making it out just in the nick of time, what the fuck is that? Oh, no. Okay, well at least Casca's. oh, of course it has her too. You know what? No. I'm not sure what this Mandragoran sleep paralysis baby thing is, but I'm not dealing with it. I'm done. God damn it. We then do battle fighting what would happen if Junji Ito got his hands on the Pikmin franchise. After weed whacking the shit out of the thing, it falls to the ground freeing Casca. 
Guts rushes over to her to make sure she's okay and- Gutsu? Did she just say his name? Due to her being submerged in that Mandragoran goo for however long, for a brief instance, Casca returns to herself, telling Guts she had the weirdest dream, right as she reverts back to her day state. Right when you think we have another sad, tragic ending for Guts, we cut back to a dying Balzac laying in his own blood. During the fight from earlier, Rita lost the necklace she found from Sister Ariza. And of course, the necklace with the bayonet on it gets enveloped by Balzac's blood, causing... <laughs> Guts bursts into the room, only to realize that the Baron had sacrificed his own wife, becoming this abomination. One of the trippiest fights I've ever played begins as rings of ice spin across the void that used to be Balzac's throne room, setting the scene for our final, final showdown. Upon defeating the Baron, a somber song begins to play as we see shots of the town and Guts and his crew emerge into the streets. You'd think that defeating the Baron and having some folks go back to themselves would return the town to peace. However, we see a hatred for the Mandragoran has been sown too deep as the townsfolk beat those who were possessed, even though they've returned back to normal. Guts comments on the brutality, saying it's just human nature to be vicious and cruel, as the group leaves the town and we fade to the outskirts of the village. Guts and Rita bid their farewells as Puck asks Rita if she'll be safe on her own. Rita says she's always been on her own, and there's no need to worry. Guts tells her that by herself, she's free to go wherever the wind takes her, as they turn around and Guts continues his path of sleepless nights. Rita whispers a thank you under her breath as the camera pans up to the sky. Sticking around after the credits, though, gives us Skullbro, I mean Skull Knight, arriving inside Balzac's throne room where we defeated him earlier. He hops off his horse, picking up the bale that Balzac had, and eats it. Hey, I heard they're a high-protein snack. And everyone, that was Sword of the Berserk, Guts' Rage. Who would have thought that a console-exclusive Berserk game from over 20 years ago would have been this great? Apparently there was another Berserk game developed by the same group of people who made this one on the PS2. And it's a shame, because from gameplay I've seen of it, it looks just as good as this one, if not better. The game had a fantastic score done by Susumu Hirasawa, who did the score for the 90s anime. The voice acting was really good, even having some notable talents from other games at the time. I only had a few minor gripes with the game, the biggest being that I wish the Dragon Slayer didn't have so much collision with items in the rooms, making moments like the end going through the Baron's lab such a pain. All in all, it's a great looking and a great sounding game. If you're a Berserk fan, or even if you're not, give this game a look. I'm telling you, it's a blast. And as always, everybody, thanks for watching, and I'll see you later.